Greetings and hello to everyone. This is the Business of Betting podcast, and I'm your host, Jake Williams. Today is episode three, and I had the privilege and pleasure of interviewing a legend in the Australian bookmaking and betting world, Dominic Byrne. Dominic began his career in 1980, going on to be the highest on-course turnover bookmaker in New South Wales. It was even reported Dominic was the highest in the world for any on-course local bookmaker. Dominic takes us into the mind of a world-class bookmaker and some of the strategy behind bookmaking, odds fluctuations, and how he handled the horse racing markets throughout his career. Before we go to Dominic, you can find us at businessofbetting.com or at bettingpod on Twitter. Please fire in any questions or feedback and potential guests you would like to have on the show. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy my chat with Dominic Byrne. Today, I'm joined by Dominic Byrne. Dominic, thank you for coming on. It's a pleasure, Jake. I'm looking forward to it. So, Dominic, you're a very well-known figure, certainly in Australia and uh, around the world even. Um, You're renowned in Australia, very, very well-respected. So, from a starting point, do you want to just take us through the early days of Dominic Byrne and how you got involved in the betting industry? Well, Jake, I was always, uh, my family was always involved in uh, gambling in a very small way. My father was a bookmaker and as an early teenager, I would be off to the races and learning mathematical tricks to determine the odds in the next race by recording the this and the next doubles on the totalizator board and calculating what the prices would be in the next race and observing my father do form out of a newspaper, racing newspaper here called The Sportsman, and marking it up with various notations that, uh, you know, I knew as second nature by the time I was an early teenager. So I went into actuarial studies from school, and um, but the love of gambling uh, got me, and I, I didn't quite, I didn't finish my course, but uh, I've employed most of those uh, skills I learnt at uni uh, through my life. Uh, At age 20, I started working for a bookmaker and I became a a penciler. He's the person who records before they had computers at the track, records the bets and has to analyse, keep calculating and recalculating the the risk liability for the bookmaker. And, you know, by 21, I was doing the morning line in the uh, local uh, newspaper in New South Wales so I had to go into the offices of the uh, newspaper and read their form guide and produce the what you call in America the morning line on all the races. So and then I was doing radio interviews at uh, 21. So by the time I became a bookmaker at age 25, you know I was um, someone said, "Oh, he, he was an overnight success," but the overnight success was a long time in the molding as it is with uh, many people. By 27, I had the highest turnover of any bookmaker in the world betting just on local events. So at, you know, going to the races on a Saturday and a Wednesday uh, only, I had a turnover of 50, 60 million, um, you know, in the uh, early 80s, mid 80s. So, you know, I'd, uh, that that was my beginning in the industry, yes. 50 to 60 million turnover, that's incredible. Thinking about that now and and how long ago that was, that's quite a large number. so take me back to the track then. What in a day on a Wednesday or a, or a Saturday at Rose Hill or Randwick, I would imagine, or even Kembla Grange, those places. What range of emotions would you go through on a day at the track? Were you well and truly composed as you seem to be um, publicly, or was it was there any fear involved? I mean, those numbers put fear in you know my eyes when I when I write them down. But what about for you at a, a normal day at the track? Well, you know you. I had a reputation of being uh, stoic and uh, hard to read. I found it valuable to be thus because, you know, a, a large punter would come up to have a bet with me and the horse may be going to shorten in the betting and I had to play a poker face because there'd be, you know, tens if not hundreds of people paying attention to what I was doing at the racetrack. Uh, this was a time when even on a Wednesday there was, you know, thousands of people at the races and uh you know, on a given Saturday, I might hold um, 
uh, you know, four or 500 individual bets. As a sole trader betting just for 20 or 25 minutes, that was a, quite, quite a lot. Did it erase fear? Well, I did have times when a single punter may, may have been able to put me out of business, and I relied very heavily on um, the work that I had done in advance so that the odds protected me. You know, the bookmaker's edge uh, that, you know, you have on the board, I might have on the board 125%, which means if I laid every horse proportionally and held $125, I'd pay out 100 But it never works that way, you know, because, you know, you're going to make mistakes horses are going to be priced longer and come down so you it was crucial for me as the largest bookmaker and in a position where it was very difficult for me to offload any bets if I had a very large liability on something you know because I was so far and away the highest turnover bookmaker uh, you know I, I couldn't I lay off so I had to be extremely confident that the odds at which I was laying the horses uh, was accurate enough so you mentioned the bookmaker's edge um, what percentage of races would you say would you had a green book where that edge was enough or is that mo- almost all the races you're involved with or whether those massive punters who came in and and there was just no possible way to maintain a green book on those races uh, in my day, uh, I would say I might have had a green book one in a thousand. Generally, I was I was a gambling bookmaker, and I relied upon the fact that uh, I would win over a period. Back back in my day, it was you know not frowned upon to uh, have twenty percent of your punters would be likely to win from you over a period. You know there was very clever. Uh, punters at the track from whom you learned uh, you, you, they would inform your book and inform your odds and inform the fluctuation of horses so when they bet horses prices shortened and you know you were able to um, maybe take a bigger risk you may get confirmation from smart punters that what you thought I thought myself was indeed true that he was a th- two to one chance, for instance, that I might not have liked. And then a big punning syndicate like the Legal Eagles, who are mathematicians, they might have started betting a seven to one chance and a 12 to one chance in that race. Well, that would give me great confidence to then take a big risk with the two to one chance. And and there was always plenty of money around for favourites. So in, in essence, uh, I was very, very... Um, well prepared to gamble heavily on my opinion uh, because when I was laying such a, a large bets, you know, $100,000 at, you know, even money or two to one, and I, and I knew I would only hold 150 or 100000 or 200000 on the race, uh, well, if I held a $100,000 bet, I might hold 200000 on the race. I know that I'm going to have to take a risk against that horse so essentially i played the horse and i played the punter but i was aware and i was prepared to um let get set with me punters who were you know able to win that doesn't seem to be uh, a philosophy now with many of the bookmakers who uh, frown upon anyone who can um, make a profit Certainly, and I, th- I would imagine there was a, probably a few nervous races throughout your time. Um, you were bookmaking in the 80s and 90s, and there was a stock market crash in the late 80s, I believe. Did that have any impact on, on your bookmaking business and, I guess, the, the money that was flowing in and around the track? I, I would say uh, I was probably one person who was massively impacted by by it. it it didn't cost me personally i've never invested in the stock exchange but in 87 i turned over 60 odd million um as a sole trader that's that's a, that's a lot of money um and you know i was having to take uh, significant risks uh when the stock exchange crashed there was a number of my larger punters who immediately uh, withdrew from the market. They just, you know, the last thing they could do would be go to have a bet at the races. Um, they, the 
problem I had, I my turnover reduced to maybe 40 million the following year, and I realized that I had about 10 or 15 million dollars worth of value in my book, and the rest of it was really risky. So the the, the 20% of punters that I referred to who were regular, you know, regular winner, winners, they were still there. Of the 80% of punters who were, you know, I, I could beat, I'd say 20 to 40% of that um, disappeared. So I was left with a situation where my uh, my books were never going to be as good. So in 88, I um, asked for a sabbatical. You know, I approached the authorities and said, look, I'm going to take a few months off. It was winter and uh, regroup. And I never went back to it. Um, and I uh, chose different directions in in, in horse racing, but uh, I've always maintained uh, my, my interest and always maintained my uh, my participation in the industry. What type What type of impact did that have on the the market? Obviously, with you dropping out, um, I'm sure there would have been a significant difference in what was going on on a day to day basis. Is that right, or was it was it consumed by other people and other bookmakers uh, taking on those clients and that risk and that that money? Uh, the generally speaking, the uh, some of the big players uh, couldn't get set anymore. But you know, they found uh, you know that they would be able to spread their money around a little bit. But they couldn't walk up to you know couldn't walk up to me. I wasn't there, so you know they couldn't have a hundred thousand on a two to one chance. So they'd have to spread their money around, which they you know they're big they were big corporate uh, entities often, and you know they weren't too interested in doing that. And uh, so bookmaking. From the late 80s has uh, shrunk uh, significantly over time. It wouldn't be I, I, my ego is not big enough to say that it was because of me. Um, I was a part of the shrinking, uh, but the telecast of races races are off track. Um, uh, broadcasting um, made it attractive to be at home and watch a horse race and stay with your family and uh, and. Any, and then telephone betting was allowed. So you went, it was illegal in the in my day to have a telephone at the track, even though you know I owned a, a mobile phone in the eighties. There, there was a, it was illegal to you know use it or you know. And the um, then then corporate bookmakers uh, came on the scene late nineties, uh, two thousand, and they attracted people away from the track so there's been a, a, a general um, diminution of on course activity well if you don't say it maybe I can that it sounds like those halcyon days of being able to be set for such large amounts uh, started to dwindle once you left so I guess that's a badge of honor I suppose um, you mentioned about people going away from the track what are the main one or two things that are lost from not having that I guess the vibe and the energy and the amount of money being uh, being splashed around at the track uh, like it was in the 80s and those days as opposed to now. Is there, is there one or two things you can sort of pinpoint um, that are lost and that have changed that I guess the industry would be better off with? Well, the industry would be better off with large crowds at the races daily. You know, when I – my first day I worked was at uh, a, a country race meeting and – there were there would have been you know three thousand people there, and they were serious race goers or horse owners. And now you you can't get three thousand on a Saturday here at the major at the at a major race course uh, unless it's a very very large feature day. Um, we have some feature days where they might get just five thousand people go go to the races, and. You know the vibe. When you talk about the the, the vibe of it, the action that was um, generated from people standing around the the ring, watching the bookmakers open the odds, and all the bookmakers' clerks writing down. Well, let's say I was the one who opened the odds on this on, on this mythical race I, I refer to. I would start to put the prices up from you know number one and put the. Put by the, if there were sixteen runners, by the time I'd put up the price on number sixteen, my clerks had probably written twenty bets, and they might be going to hold four or five hundred bets on the race. Well, the activity 
it generated was, you know, all the people observing, the other bookmakers, clerks, watching who was having a bet, running off and feeding um, information back into the ring, bookmakers, uh, punters spreading their action across the other bookmakers. There was money to go around uh, for everybody. Uh, now at the races, there's, you know, even on feature days, there's, you know, just a huddle of maybe a dozen bookmakers and very little activity. You know, there's there's days when, you know, they, you know, midweek meetings, they they be flat out writing more than 20 bets, you know, over eight races. They do it for the love of it. I think they they do it for the habit of it. Uh, how profitable it is, you know, it will, you know, it's just gone. One of the saddest things I think uh, uh, about it is the, of these 20% I referred to who are capable winners, they've been shrunken into, you know, nothing, you know. So they might have been punters who in the late 80s might put $10,000 on an even money chance who eventually, you know, have, you know, bookmakers didn't have large books. They couldn't take their bets. They got shrunken and shrunken and shrunken. And many of these very, very clever people who inspired other activity in the betting ring, they are now working for uh, working for bookmakers or they're selling tips online. You know, they've all been uh, lost to the vibe of the thing that used to exist. Yeah, okay. So I guess nowadays then, if we imagine a betting utopia where there was sort of no limits and no restrictions, are there more than one or two ways to win long term? And you mentioned, of course, the bookmaker's edge earlier, maybe on the punting side. Can you survive, you know, betting only three to one and under or 10 to one and over? Or are, are there dozens of ways to win in your mind with your experience? Well, there are lots of ways to uh, to win. I mean, horse racing, uh, in my opinion, and, uh, you know, I suppose betting on sport, uh, are the, are the Key, key key and only opportunities to be able to outsmart the uh, marketplace. Uh, bookmakers uh, have to offer a price. I mean, they don't have any choice. They've got to put a price up. And a punter doesn't have to be right on every single price. A bookmaker has to be right on all the prices. So a punter can try and find the edge that he has somewhere. And in, in order to... Um, uh, to win, you know, some punters are, you know, zero in on, you know, one really uh, narrow expertise that they might have. So a winning punter might be a jurisdictional expert, you know, uh, he doesn't require particularly advanced analytics, um, they're analysing in their heads, uh, you know, so if he has an intricate local knowledge, he can win by knowing a lot about a single factor, for example, the factor might be the track work at this uh, at this race course, or the trials of a specific racing stable or footy team that he follows, um, and this jurisdictional expert's edge restricts him to a small number of bets per year, but he will win because bookies offer a generalised price because they have to offer a price on everything, but a bookmaker might not have such intricate knowledge in forming his market. You know, weather may be another localised factor. Another winning punter may be one who knows quite a few local factors and approaches things more analytically by keeping records and finding patterns in factors and outcomes. Uh, but this punter may know very little about the, the same code, you know, ra whether it's racing or sport, outside his own area. And we could say that such jurisdictional experts contain themselves to what they're good at, you know, on a vertical level, whereas bookies have to play on a horizontal horizontal level, offering odds on all racing events and all sporty matches. So, um, uh, you know, are there more than one way to win? Well, you know, you can win being a jurisdictional punter that, uh, with without advanced analytics, but a punter who wants to play across many areas and many codes has to look deeply and analytically. Interesting. And I think, as we spoke about earlier with the, the turnover, um, the ability to, or to bet any amount you want uh, with on any market you want is obviously getting more and more difficult in this current age. So if you are restricting yourself to that one jurisdiction or certain factors, then you might struggle to get that, that turnover down. 
Well, the, yes, the, well, that, that's, that's, that's true generally. Uh, the, there are opportunities. Bookmakers are prepared to lay a bigger book if there's going to be a lot of action on the on the event, uh, but some bookmakers are, are just scared. They, they just don't want to take the action, and they just close the accounts of um, hunters who are too good. Um, whereas, you know, there are bookmakers here who still play the old-fashioned way, and but they are restricted by the event that they're offering. So, if this afternoon there's a country race meeting. And well, let's single one out. Tabcorp, for instance, might be offering um, a market at uh, Lismore races in a, a maiden race, and somebody wants to put, you know, a thousand dollars on a hundred to one chance. Well, he's not going to get set. You know, they might bet him uh, fifty dollars of his of his of his of his money and take a you know five thousand dollar risk. If, on the other hand, he wants to put a thousand dollars on a hundred to one, he wants to put ten thousand dollars on a hundred to one chance in the Melbourne Cup. They will take the million dollar risk because they know proportional to the size of their book. Uh, I, I think the, the, the they, they can therefore take the risk. Betting exchanges uh, offer a, a different sort of product where if there's enough liquidity, you know, the um, punter can get set. Um, one of the problems with uh, um, betting exchanges is, you know, there's often little uh, li liquidity, um, but as I understand it, there are, you know, there, there, this, that, that space may be changing quite rapidly, especially over where, over in Europe, where, you know, there are some pretty big opportunities to get set on, you know, sports events in US and sports events in, uh, in, in Europe. Betfair seems to be discussed a lot. Um, has it been as successful as they had hoped, do you think, in Australia? Because... Like I said, it's discussed by punters and professionals and, and certainly on you know the, the radio and things like that. Betfair seems to be a mysterious and beautiful creature that is certainly helpful and also can be hard to crack. But has it been something that I think uh, has had a huge impact in Australia or is it struggling with you know the volume and those type of issues? Well, it's a pretty broad question. Uh, I actually worked with Bedfair for quite a few years. I ran uh, masterclasses um, coaching uh, people how to, you know, do uh, racehorse form. And I, uh, you know, used to do uh, regular interviews with them. The product they offer, uh, they recently lost a court case where they appealed against the uh, a, um, a ruling whereby uh, Racing New South Wales successfully won uh, the right to charge all bookmakers a percentage of their turnover, uh, and they based that they called it the race fields um, in order to publish the race fields, which Racing New South Wales organises all the horses to run, the jockeys to turn up, the racetrack, etc. It's very expensive business to run. Well, if you want to bet on that business uh racing yes well said well you you know you've got to pay us a percentage of your turnover now the court betfair argued that because of the way that their product is aligned um set, structured that you know they couldn't pay the same extent they were happy to pay something but they couldn't pay that would have been found it difficult to pay the same as a corporate bookmaker for instance who's only playing against um dumb punters because he's you know sacked all the smart guys you know a, a, a betting exchange only ends up with you know pennies and you know but anyway they've got to um Racing New South Wales won the court case, and Betfair has to uh, has to pay. So it's it's a that's not the only thing that's um, uh, been an inhibitor for Betfair. But in in general terms, Betfair has made very good strides down here in Australia, and and uh, you know people like to bet on exchanges, and so they see it as a way to you know place a bet not just back themselves to pick a winner, but, you know, back themselves to be able to anticipate the uh, way the market might move and, 
you know, make a green green book, even if it's just on individual horses, and you know, back it at seven dollars and lay it back at five dollars, as, as you know. Um, the the key to uh, uh, yeah. So to answer your question, yeah, Bet- Betfair did make good inroads here in in Australia, and it's quite and it's quite popular. Uh, so I, they they'll always struggle, I think, with um, uh, you know liquidity, having um, enough money in the in the book to offer. Uh, the the you know everyone everyone I know all the colleagues I, I know uh, especially the guys I know overseas uh, all bet with uh, Matchbook which is uh, an, a, another uh, another exchange which seems to have uh, really strong liquidity on the events you know if you that that uh, they like to bet on and uh, you know don't get knocked back you know so it's, you, you know you could ring up and have ten thousand you can you can see the odds there and have ten thousand on a five to one chance. Well, you know, and these these guys are winning punters. These are winners, and you know, winner backers just can't get ten thousand on at five to one. You know, unless you go to Tab Corp, and it's a you know, it's a significant race. You can't get it on with uh, most of the other bookmakers if you're a winner. I've always been fascinated by the strategy behind the bookmaking. Um, you know, I used to remember standing at the track, you know, Mooney Valley or Flemington, and seeing the odds change, and always wondered how and when and why. And obviously, there's a number of factors that go into it um i guess my question is is that a is there a strategy in place behind that or is there a lot of you know using a trained eye and understanding the market and the people who are betting or is it simply um a little bit of gut feel and a little bit of i guess see how the the betting is unfolding and go from there is there a a pure bookmaking strategy behind a lot of it is a pure mathematics or is there something else involved there are there are all those things that you mentioned in uh, little bits and pieces, but some some bookmakers uh, have a a broad outlook and would ad- adapt all of those philosophies that you uh, and and others are just uh, copycats and followers. The the uh, if we focus just on what happens at the track, most of the bookmakers you know in the ninety percent uh, don't really know the. Um, form intricately enough to tell you that this horse that you know in this 10 10 horse race this horse is ten dollars is it more likely to start 15 or 5 or stay around 10 they couldn't tell you you know they are um behavioral uh, behavior analysts you know they're going to watch the activity of the uh, punters who would make the sh- odds shorten and uh, maybe stable connected people who might enter the ring and uh, look like they're going to have a bet or do in fact have a bet so most of them are followers when i was a bookmaker i had to have a sense of all of the facets i had to spend many many hours in advance knowing what i thought were the true odds of the horse but in any case, I could only ever have a range in my mind. And, you know, if I thought that range was somewhere between, um, you know, $10 and $15, you know, if it was a very, very big punting stable or it had a particular – it was first up from a spell, for instance, and all the factors weren't completely apparent to me, I might put it up a, a safer price, you know, closer to the 10 If I thought that – if it was a small punting stable, I'd seen all of the uh, action of, of this horse leading up to the race at race seven days ago. I saw how it ran to the line. It had a clear run. I knew all its form before that. I might be prepared to put up very, very close to the price that I think it was going to start. So I might put up 15. By putting up 15, I would be attracting any of the professionals who've similarly done form and created their hunting mathematical answer to 100% who thought 15 was value and they might charge over to me to take the 15 because they think it's going to come down. So if it was ignored though, I'd be pretty confident that if a big punter then wanted to come along and have a bet at 15, someone I knew I would bet, I would just take the bet and not turn the price down. I can recall betting one day uh, a punter had twenty thousand dollars each way at twenty five to one in a in a big race, and I didn't alter the odds. One, I couldn't afford for the price to come down because I don't want to, you know, other prices to go out because of it. Um, but secondly, I, I thought I would beat him over a period. 
uh, the things that make a market fluctuate usually, well, it's weight of money, uh, but generally speaking, it was uh, the big movements in markets were on horses that had an unknown factor. They have never been to the races before or they haven't raced for six months and they might have gone out and they've changed stable or they may have improved significantly. Things that I, as a form analyst, could not be privy to, but the weight of money informed me. Okay, and in those situations, obviously market intelligence plays a huge role and I think, you know, I always see then when a horse has been gelded for some reason, whatever, I don't know what the reason is, but they seem to imply that it can run faster when it comes back um, from a spell in that situation. Is there any situations where you might ignore the market intelligence? Um, if it's a horse that's had, you know, 60 starts and the price is just something that's incomprehensible, would you be inclined to ignore something like that or is it always going to be a factor? Um, okay, so to, I, I think there's a two ways to answer that. As a, as a bookmaker, I had tremendous confidence as a form analyst uh, rightly or wrongly, that uh, the more information I had, the more confident I was of the odds. And I've described a situation there before when I might be less confident. But as you say, something that's had 60 starts and I can line up its handicap against the other horses and what it's been doing recently, I can be pretty confident. If there's a large mo movement of money on the horse, you know, the price might shorten a little bit. If it's then, then for another horse and then another one, you might start getting suspicious that horses that are high in the market who are being ignored, uh, there may be some market intelligence to be gauged from that, that, you know, there may not, I might think something's a $3 chance and it's, you know, $3 on my board. And if all the market intelligence is betting other horses and I can see that and I can feel that, there may be something wrong with that three dollar horse and it starts to move out these these are the kind of movements that you see now on uh, betfair and matchbook that uh, inform the punter which did not exist when i was a bookmaker so uh, punters are extremely well informed just by obs making observations of what's happening in the market whereas you know they were blind to that when most of the big bets were coming on with me and I poker faced, didn't let people know which ones that I had the big money for. Mm. And talking about moving the odds, I've always wondered what impact that has had on the overall edge of the bookmaker. And obviously in sports and, and line betting, and certainly in the NFL, for example, there's a lot of money bet, uh, and you've got a three-point favorite and a three-point underdog. Moving that off the three-point um, off the three-point line obviously has a mathematical impact. When it comes to horse racing, though, is that edge, in a simple example, if you've got, you know, a 10-horse race, a eighty favorite and a three twenty second favorite and then eight other horses, if, let's say, over the course of the last 30 minutes of betting, that eighty favorite went out to three twenty, and the three twenty favorite came into a eighty, does that have a significant impact on the overall edge or is it sort of cleaned up in the wash of people betting either way on the way through? Okay, well, you know, that's a, an extreme example and it's best to place a, 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 an extreme example in order to uh, get your point across. The, the, the one fundamental thing I was taught by uh, the, my boss before I became a bookmaker myself was um, to anti anticipation. He said, if you can anticipate the market, you know, you've got far more chance than all the other bookmakers at the track. In, in that circumstance there, um, I'd like to think that, you know, I was potentially because I was a, a punting bookmaker as well. So I was prepared to play both sides of the market. And it was kind of frowned upon a little bit by my colleagues who uh, were generally just bookmakers. Um, there was, you know, I wasn't the only punting bookmaker, but, you know, I was probably the dominant one. In that circumstance there, I might have been betting the horse at $3, to punting on the horse at three twenty and $3. And I might have been the first one to go two dollars the horse that i thought was going to ease in the market and i might get a i'm consequently might get a magnificent book and you know when the three dollar twenty horse on its way down to a dollar eighty got to two dollars i might be prepared to take really big set against it so whilst i i might have let's say i priced these horses both at two dollars thirty 
I might have pushed one out early on, laid it at two dollars, backed the other one at three twenty, then laid it back at two dollars. I might have had a magnificent book. On the other hand, there'd be times when there, then I got it completely wrong, and the marketplace who bet with me at three twenty and then three dollars, you know, and I'm thinking other bookmakers are going two dollars fifty. The one that I've got two dollars thirty. I'm thinking, gee, it's got out too far. And then the market just kept moving and moving and moving. Well, I'd have to go to the race and watch that race with a huge gamble. And, and uh, you know, when you were talking about the fear earlier, uh, I'd watch that race with, you know, quite some fear because there may, you know, something in the, in the market I wasn't aware of has, um, you know, been revealed to the punters who bet it or they were just smarter in their analysis than me on this occasion. Generally speaking, in in that circumstance there, where the horse might start a fifty five percent favourite and the other one thirty percent when they were flipped from the other way, you know, I'd say the the, the horse that was really heavily bet would have won close to two thirds of the time. You would be, you you would be deservedly losing on that race if you weren't aware. On the other hand, if I was the one who drove the market movements, you know, I'd be pretty likely to uh, profit interesting it would it be fair to say you mentioned you were more of a punting bookmaker would it be fair to say that those non-punting behavioral you know watching the market bookmakers um they would be fine in those situations overall the large sample size would they get out okay in those large market swing situations now they'd get killed in that circumstance over over a period the 320 to a dollar 80 horse they probably realistically most bookmakers have probably averaged it at around 270 they haven't averaged it at two dollars yeah because you know the horse is shortening and they're getting more scared and you know they're reaching for the other one there's not much action for it uh and uh, you know they, they, they were getting killed fortunately that's a you know, quite a unique circumstance yeah, you've uh, you, you've created. Uh, but in those races, there, you know, they got killed. There were some famous betting plunges here, um, where horses were having their first start in a race or second start in a race after a long layoff from their first run, and were bet down from a hundred to one down to five or six to one. Uh, there's another one, you know, uh, owned by the same guy, Mark Reed, who was bet down from uh, 10 to one down to two to one. And they, they both walked in, you know, and it, it wasn't a matter of whether they would win or not. It was a matter of by how far they would win and how much would the bookmaker lose. You know, these, these, were, these were horses that you could have taken the final price on such a plunge. If you... If you looked at all those big plunges through over time and you took the starting price, you know, the horses that were bet from 100 to 1 down to 5 to 1, you win handsomely taking the starting price at the 5 to 1. Yeah. Yeah, and I think certainly these days when the markets come out on, you know, Wednesday or Thursday and you have those horses that open up, you know, 10, 12, 14, 16, 16 to 1, and they might start four dollars or three dollars. Those it's very hard, certainly for me, to know whether or not that is a plunge or it's been you know a few hundred dollars early in the week that's moved it down from sixteen to eleven to one to eight fifty and then to five to one, and whether or not that is a legitimate plunge or if it's just been a given the current situation with you know corporate bookmaking as it seems to be now, um, whether they are legitimate or not. I I, th I think the answer to that is that uh, it's simply. Nine times out of ten, it's just the error of the of the marketplace in the first place. I mean, you know, the book the bookmakers, uh, the traders who set the odds and have to go up first, they're compelled to bet. As I, as I was saying, they bet horizontally. They've got an offer a price on everything, and they've you know they're going to make mistakes. So, generally speaking, if a horse has come sixteen down to four between Wednesday afternoon and Saturday morning at nine o'clock when all the scratchings are through if it's come from 16 to four it was just an error um if it if it then comes from four down to two and a half if, between saturday morning and the afternoon well that's a plunge or if it came from 16 on saturday morning to four by post time that's a plunge i don't i, I don't think anyone is recognizing any more that 16 down to four between wednesday and saturday morning is a plunge 
it's just the market forces uh, re- realigning what probably should have been the case in the first place. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, this can be a deep dive sort of topic, but you know, as briefly as possible, do you want to just touch on, in your mind, what is the optimal wagering strategy? And I know it can be different, but um, it seems like the Kelly criterion is a is a key aspect in all of this. But um, I know you were on the the bookmaking side, but you certainly had a an impact on the betting side. Is Kelly the way to go in your mind? Well, you know, I'm uh, I'm not anything to do with bookmaking anymore. I'm uh, I, I am a punter, um, and uh, I'm a paramutual punter. I like the the tote. I like to hide my action, um, whilst I publicly might make statements about various horses through the year. We have fifteen thousand races we can bet on in Australia. So commenting on the Melbourne Cup or Sydney Cup is uh, not going to impact my uh, annual um, profit or return. Um, so from a punning perspective, uh, I always advocate there's no last race and, you know, you probably should be really quite consistent and um, a fractional Kelly um, based on a, you know, large percentage of your bank um, is the way I uh, bet. Uh, Kelly's a very aggressive uh, way to bet and, you know, you could, uh, you know, you, you, you could send your broke or, send you crazy if you have a bad run um so a fractional kelly whereby you know you, you might combine your market that with the uh, public market and halve it um you know or you just put half the money down that it tells you it's the same equation effectively um a 50 percent kelly but i actually take a little bit of a different approach i i like to keep some money separate um and so whilst i have a a consistent way of putting my money down. Um, I also have a separate bank um, that I like to um, play more aggressively as a as a full as a full Kelly, um, but it it's it's randomised on the uh, not randomised. Its its function is against how I'm going on the day because in my experience, uh, my computer can run really really hot or really really cold on a given race meeting and often I don't know why it, it's happening because there's an outside variable that's impacting me positively or negatively. So I, on one hand, I've got this one bank that I uh, run religiously, like there's no last race and I just, you know, consistently play. Um, but the, but the, sec- the second one is that I, I bet shrinking amounts when I'm losing and I bet increasing amounts when I'm when I'm winning. Now, I think the logic for this has been that the computer may have an edge on the market. Um, uh, as I say, it, it could be that uh, my computer, which has a um, track bias um, factor, has read the market very, very early, uh, earlier than the marketplace and is uh, smarter. And so race three and race four, I might have a significant edge. Well, you know, I, I would like to exaggerate my win in that circumstance. Similarly, if I've lost on all the early races, you know, with this second bank of mine, I'd like to decrease the amounts because it, it may be something there like, you know, I haven't read the uh, the information about the wind or, you know, I might be betting on a race meeting at, um, at, at somewhere and it's you know, just, they've just bucketed down with rain and I'm unaware of it coming in coming into a race and then all of a sudden the results become a little bit haphazard. So, uh, yeah, so to answer your question, yes, I, I like to um, bet like so a half Kelly uh, for m- a, a most of my bank, um, most of my bets, but I like also to have this um, where I, other little bank where I'm kind of parlaying a little bit and so I can come away with a uh, – you know, a monstrous win by, you know, not like not not a monstrous win by my old standards, but you know, relative to the betting I do today. So you mentioned that there may be something that isn't necessarily factored in. In that case, when you don't know what the factor is, but you know that it's a either a positive or a detriment, will you let's say it's a positive? Will you continue betting larger amounts without applying any logic to what that might be? Are you happy to do that, and vice versa with yes. reducing? Yes. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, it probably drives you crazy to a certain extent, not knowing what it might be and how to adjust the variables in certain algorithms. But 
it's an interesting concept to just know that there's something in there that you don't know and still having the the ability to continue on either way positively or negative yep so and i know we always think we're at the tip of the sword when it comes to data and information but it seems as though and certainly compared to the past we're in a new information age uh, when it comes to wagering i know i've heard famous stories about you and your team you would go to the trials and and clock horses each sectional uh, each furlong different sectionals or, or film the the trials and there weren't too many people at the trials in those days and now you can basically get any trial on youtube if you like and there's different you know sectional offerings out there do you think in general that with all this new information it is a re- it in general will reduce the edge uh, for a lot of smarter betters or is it something that is still there's a lot of noise out there there's a lot of information and it's a it's still on those very smart handicappers and very smart people in the industry to find what are, I guess, the most useful and the most influential uh, in framing markets and betting. Well, there's no doubt that the marketplace has just got smarter and smarter and smarter, and uh, therefore the edge that you know punters and people who would you know do a lot of work that other people weren't doing um, many years ago. You know, we had a, we had a significant edge at the time, and yes, that edge has disappeared. So now it's you know basically down to uh, your math versus somebody else's math um, to hope that you can uh, make a profit. One of the uh, largest detriments in um, in Australian uh, wagering is uh, that the marketplace is has been stretched over some days so the marketplace as you referred to earlier might go up on a saturday afternoon race it might go up on wednesday and then people snipe at that horse that you referred to comes down from sixteen dollars down to four dollars you know saturday morning uh you know it might come from four dollars to two dollars fifty the example we gave earlier by race time so I myself may have assessed this horse as a $3.20 chance. Let's say I was right on top of this situation and I think it's a $3.20 chance. Well, I can't bet at $16 on Wednesday because I can't get any money on. Uh, I'm not interested in betting at $4 in the morning because, uh, you know, one, I, I don't know which way the market's going to move with any um, certainty at, at that time of the day. I don't know some of the factors that are going to influence my ultimate decision to put a bet on. Thirdly, $4, a $3.20 chance is not that big a deal to think, well, you know, I'm really confident this is going to start less than, so I put my down. So, you know, I wait and I bet. Uh, and fourthly, if I put my money on, then the price comes down and then the Quinellas and Trifectas and, you know, First Four, etc. the Quadrellas, the Daily Doubles, if that's one of the legs, all get the odds on that horse. I'm just shooting myself in the foot just by having a, a win bet at 9 o'clock in the morning. So I would never bet um, such, such a horse. So one of the detriments to having market intelligence, being more intelligent than the market, is that you have to, you know, watch for three days the market being informed whereas it used to be that uh 25 minutes before the race you know the bookmakers put the price up and you know it was uh that was the opening and you could see the mistakes and you could bet one now you could let the market settle down and bet another one with seven minutes to go and then but the yeah so that that's that's made it much more difficult for somebody who has a good uh sense of what the true odds are but let's say in that circumstance that i'm referring to now the horse three dollars i think it's a 320 chance and i'm a paramutual better and at the time that they jump it's showing 250 well i might have liked to have bet that horse i might have liked it might be my favorite i might have expected it to win i'm now betting three or four horses in the market that have been ignored and i'm hoping that over time the way that the market has fluctuated those horses and those horses on the drift they 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 win in their turn and uh so that is that is one of the difficulties um uh but the more informed market has made it more difficult and it has reduced the um edge the return on investment 
uh, from punting now compared to 10 years ago and certainly from 25 years ago has certainly shrunk. Interesting. So when you, you mentioned you're betting a lot in paramutuals now uh, to hide the money, and is there any way in that situation to, for want of a better word, guarantee or get close to guaranteeing a certain price? I mean, if you're betting very, very late, you can obviously you know monitor the pools and those type of things, but is there any way to have you know any sort of assurance that you're going to get a price that you know is you know positive expectation yes well you control the amount you you bet so the algorithm that you apply your to, to the amount you put on is governed by the uh, size of the pool naturally so if i'm betting on a race at uh, uh, toowoomba on a uh, saturday and it's jammed between all these other races uh toowoomba for your listeners is a, a country meeting and if it's an early race uh it, it might be jammed between all these other races and the Quinella pool might only be holding a thousand dollars. Well, you know, m- my Quinella on a, on two five to one chances might be, you know, a dollar fifty. But I'm happy to put that on if I, if I think that, uh, you know, the, I've determined that, you know, the ride odds is, uh, 10 to one and they're going to pay me 15 to one. But I'm not, uh, you know, uh, the same day, Five minutes later, there might be a major race at Ramwick, and I might have uh, fifteen hundred dollars on that Quinella. So you know, it's all proportional to the um, and in order to, as you said, maintain a positive expectation, it's all governed by the size of the pool and the bet that you're allowed to have. Okay, and I think it all goes back to what you mentioned earlier about no race is the last race. It's just a it's an ongoing perpetual thing. So. I'm interested in any thoughts you have on the future of, of corporate bookmaking and perhaps Betfair if they have a place, certainly in Australia. Um, and I think with regards specifically to volume and how um, it seemingly is going with you know reducing turnover for corporate bookmakers as opposed to increasing and some of the numbers you mentioned earlier on about your turnover back in the 80s and 90s um, is staggering to consider considering what we're dealing with today yes well there are still some bookmakers who uh you know take a decent bet but but of course it's dependent upon you know how clever you are one but but primarily the size of their book um and the you know anticipated size that they're going to end up with 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 their book i think the corporate bookmakers the ones from uk who who came here and anticipated it was just a, a killing field here in Australia, um, yes, yes, they've won a lot of money from the uh, punters in Australia, but they've had to reinvest a, a you know a massive percentage of that back to them. You know, they offer money back for second, and they give you money back if your horse loses on protest, and they'll top up your account, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The the uh, I think that I think that there's been some quite some surprise by the bookmakers who've come here from um, overseas, the corporates, at you know how difficult it is to walk away with a, a big profit out of Australia, and and the and I think that the rules are you know pretty likely to be going to change. Uh, regulations are going to change. Uh, uh, the Interactive Gaming Act. Um, uh, is likely to confirm that in in, well, in play betting is uh, is banned, and the in play betting is what a lot of the corporate bookmakers in um, UK who are here uh, depend upon. And if if that uh, you know the other thing that's major in um, bookmaking news in Australia is is very likely that um, credit may may be removed as an option. So if a bookmaker can't offer credit. Uh, legally, then you know it's going to have a pretty big impact on the um, on their on their business models. So uh, where 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 is all that headed? Well, I think money is going to be driven back into the uh, paramutuals, which is a uh, um, tab corp essentially, and uh, tats in uh, Queensland. So I think m- m- money will be um, taken away from corporate bookmakers, the overseas corporate bookmakers who have had a large presence here but not the presence they anticipated and uh, fed back into um, uh, the paramutual 
uh, which is where the industry from which is the pool of money that the industry is driven upon, um, you know, maybe a uh, four percent or something goes back to the industry uh and that's what drives our um large um you know we, we, it's one of the biggest industries in the country is uh, uh, horse racing and you know in some parts of australia like for instance where i live in uh, new south wales you know prize money is just gone through the roof you know that you can run way in the, what what you would observe as the outback here in the country running around for $20,000, well, you know, there's feature races in, in England that aren't worth that. You know, when I say feature races, like, you know, you look at the, you know, the horses come over here from uh, England to come and they've been purchased and to race in Australia and, and you can look at them. And they've got quite nice form and they've won, you know, 30,000 pounds. Well, you know, they're running around out the back of Burke here for, uh, you know, to win $12,000 in a, you know, in a single afternoon. So, you know, paramutual, the right, the reinvestment of money away from corporate bookmakers into paramutual is um, a good thing for the industry. And I think that it's uh, ultimately going to happen. It's, it is going to be an interesting three to five years, certainly. I know we've been going a bit over time, but I just want to finish on a couple of other points. And I do certainly appreciate your time. Um, best jockey and best horse that you saw, that you bet on, that you witnessed. I know growing up, I remember going to Mooney Valley on a Thursday night and it was Canterbury or something was on in Sydney and Darren Beedman seemingly won seven of the eight races every time. And uh, Do you have any favorites or were you not inclined to go down that path and everyone was treated sort of equally? Well, I no, I don't treat jockeys equally. I mean, I know a lot of people think uh, that, uh, you know, oh, well, if you put uh, any jockey on that horse, it might have won. Well, that might be true as a, you know, specific, but as a, you know, when you look at large data, uh, I owned a lot of racehorses and I, I bred um, quite a few Group 1 winners and ra raced a lot of uh, very good horses. And um, uh, in, in my experience and as a as a trader, um, Dar Darren Beedman was the um, most dominant jockey that uh, I saw and uh, experienced. I you know uh, I I, lo I love putting him on. Um, there was other other jockeys who you know were fearless like uh, Shane Shane Dye, uh, Malcolm Johnson w way back. I I also liked in of the, of the current crop. You know, I'd have to say, you know, Hugh Bowman has got um, is a is a tremendous jockey. I think Blake Shin is um, underrated on the world stage. I think that uh, you know you could put him on, you could park him anywhere, and he'd be a great success. But I'd say, you know, with all of that knowledge and not being one who just gets caught up in the moment, I've not seen a jockey who can do the things that Joe Marrera can do. Uh, he seems to appear from nowhere he'll park, he's got the courage to park hot favorites on the rails locked away uh maneuver his way out he's he's just incredible so um and it's a pleasure but i'll sometimes just watch the replays of uh hong kong races just to enjoy tracking joe race after race and uh and i'm aware that uh there are a lot of jockeys in australia who have the same opinion you know they They'll watch Joe and they'll say, how did he get out of there? What did he do there? You know, they're learning all the time just watching him. He's a, he is a phenomenon. As far as racehorses are concerned, my favourite horse way back in the day was Strawberry Road who ended up travelling and having an international career. And I think I ended up him being one of my favourites because I had such a very large win on him one day when he won on a, as a, big, at a big price when he came down from Queensland. But in more recent years, we've had some phenomenal racehorses in Australia, and um, the two highest rating horses on my database by quite a margin are uh, Black Caviar and Winx. And, you know, if you would ever get a chance to see Winx travel over to America, which, you know, is probably not going to happen, uh, it would be, um, you know, to be some hell of a, a spectacle because she is just getting better and better. And uh, Black Caviar was an unbeatable sprinter, and unfortunately, when she went to England, she only just scrambled across the line because she, you know, wasn't well. But you know, she still did well enough to win the race. So, you know, they'd be the best two horses I've seen. Interesting. I know. Um, 
I mean, I agree with Marrera. Some of those races you watch um, in Asia when he's when he's riding, it's just electric. Even watching on the TV on replay, and I think you know just some some of the maneuvering he does is incredible. And then you watch, and I used to like Nash Willer a lot, and you watch him the last fifty meters of a race, and he's got certainly a different style, but uh, certainly both effective. One last question before I before I let you go. You mentioned you did some actuarial studies, so I'm sure you've done a lot of reading in your time. Do you have any favorite books or any sort of publications that you lean on um, in the in the betting world? Well, I like to uh, read anything that deals with the efficiency of markets or makes me think outside the box. And uh, you know, it's probably quite an eclectic range here i'd say uh books like fooled by randomness and wisdom of crowds and mistakes were made but not by me uh, perfect bet drunkard's walk um you know freakonomics thinking fast and slow you know those sort of books that make me think oh you know i can read a paragraph and put it down and i don't want to go back to the book for two days because it just mesmerizes me and i think i I argue with the writer in my own mind or i agree with him immediately and read on but you know they're always evocative and um but racing specific books uh i'm quite friendly with nick morden and i think he writes beautifully and succinctly i I like what he i like the books he's written nick morden uh, bob wilkins andy Bayer, brohammer think pe- people like that you know uh, have in- inspired much of what i've uh, ended up thinking don scott of course was uh, uh pivotal to my the way i first started analyzing form because you know he taught me to put a, a number on a performance and a number on a sectional and so you know from that uh, i was able to um you know m- you know coagulate the form into uh, an answer Dominic, it's been a privilege having you on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Certainly a legend of the bookmaking industry and the betting world. So I appreciate your time uh, and many thanks for chatting to me today. Thanks very much, Jake.